You're listening to Language Nerds Do Earth, the podcast about linguistics, culture, travel, and how they're all connected. Now it's time for your language nerd hosts. One in China, one in Spain. It's Patrice and Rachel. Yeah, almost to 20. Pretty cool. Yeah, the still in double digits. (laughs) (laughs) The ones that start with two. (laughs) I almost said double digits and I was like, no. Come on. (laughs) Close. I know. I know. It's it's a it's still uh like a landmark, right? Yeah. Wait, is that not not landmark? Benchmark. Landmark. A milestone. A milestone. Thank you. It's still a milestone. Yeah. So our topic today is punctuation. Yeah. And before you switch off because you think that sounds boring, it's not. It's actually very interesting. First, we're going to look at some hilarious comma fails. Then we're going to talk about some punctuation marks that aren't commonly used. And then we'll look at different ways punctuation is used all over the world. Then we have a super inappropriate Lost in Translation story for you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, from Jenny in China. And before we get into the episode, we have a review on iTunes. Yay! Yay! So nice. Love that. Yeah. So from Kariba32... Language and culture differences around the world. Language and culture nuances are so interesting, and Patrice and Rachel do a great job exploring the different fascinating facets of these topics in a fun way. I love their playful banter and the different segments they do, including language news and lost in translation. Keep up the great work, y'all. Thank you so much. That's so awesome. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, that's so nice to hear. Thank yeah, you. thank you, thank you. If you want to leave us a review, they make a big difference in people being able to find us. So to do that, just go to your iTunes account and find us, and then you can leave a review on our iTunes page. That'd be awesome. Plus, it they make us really happy, so... Yes, exactly. <laughs> Don't you want us to be happy? <laughs> <laughs> Or otherwise we'll just be crying, you know? Yeah, just just sitting alone in our apartments separately. <laughs> Nobody loves us. <laughs> oh. yes. Yeah, so go give us some love, guys. Yes. Well, anyway, today we have some language news kind of related to our translation fails episode. This was kind of funny because I'm not sure maybe the author of the New York Times uh, opinion piece listened to our episode number 12 on translation fails. If you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it. I had a friend tell me it was her favorite episode of ours. Thanks, Mm. Katarina. Yeah, so he talks about mistranslations and how it's actually a big deal when something's mistranslated. Sometimes it's just, like, really funny, but sometimes it's really important to translate things the correct way. Yeah, so one of the really big points that he talks about in the article is in 1956, the infamous statement by Nikita Khrushchev, um, We Will Bury You, was mistranslated from... We will outlast you. Eh. But while that's maybe a little bit, you know, big headed or something, it's not so threatening or scary as we will bury you. Exactly. Yeah. We will bury you is very different from we will outlast you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so hence why the United States took such a strong position during the Cold War. Yeah, and I feel like we see some of it even today with the baby boomer generation. I feel like there's still a lot of Russian fear left over from that time, which is interesting. Yeah, that's true. Another example he gave was that the Armed Forces Journal in 2011 reported that interpreters in Iraq were 10 times more likely to die in combat than deployed American or international forces, which is insane. Like, that's 
awful. That's so sad. They're just there to facilitate communication. Yeah. I've heard also that that's such a dangerous job. Yeah. Then they sometimes, like, a lot of times they won't get, like, the immunity that they were promised. And they're just in a really bad situation. Yeah, especially, I mean, this is just an aside, but, like, interpreters and translators, especially interpreters who put their life on the line to make sure that there's successful communication from one side to the other are promised, oh, you can become an American citizen and then you won't be targeted as, like, working with the enemy in this war in the Middle East. And then they, like, try to become an American citizen and then it doesn't happen or it takes, like, 15 years or something and then, Mm -hmm. like, at that point it doesn't matter. (laughs) But Right, yeah. But anyway, neither the troops that these people interpret for, nor the other side they were speaking to, had complete faith in what they were relating. Right. So yeah, this kind of reminded me of how Trump just had a meeting with Putin in Helsinki, and the only people allowed in the room besides those the two world leaders were their interpreters. And yeah, I mean, it's not like those aren't people. You know, they're not machines, and they have to be really careful when they interpret. It's funny, I've read a few articles on how translators, just like they have a hell of a time trying to translate what Trump says. (laughs) Yeah, so for various reasons, but one big problem is the nature of what he's frequently talking about. Oh, yeah. So sometimes he's talking, you know, really things that come across in other cultures as very inappropriate or something offensive. And so his interpreters have to walk a very fine line of do we soften it and make it more pleasing or more less offensive to the people that he's addressing Mm -hmm. or translate him literally yeah and actually in russia some of the people who interpret his language into russian have said the language he uses in english is very childlike and they actually Mm -hmm. try to make it like more adult but still conveying the meaning of what he's saying Mm. (laughs) but yeah it's a hard line to walk actually there is a really interesting quote that we read in this article from a retired Japanese interpreter who left the profession in the 1980s. He says, As an interpreter, your job is to translate the words of a speaker exactly as they are, no matter how heinous and what an outrageous liar you find the speaker to be. You set aside all your personal emotions and become the speaker yourself. It's a really tough thing, not being allowed to demonstrate your own judgment about what is right and what is wrong. And that's why I quit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's very enlightening. Yeah, I mean, when you interpret something that maybe you don't even agree with, I think, because Trump is really inflammatory as a global presence, Mm -hmm. and all of these people who have to convey his message are conveying a message that maybe doesn't sit right with them. So, like, where is... Do they soften the message, like you said, or... Actually, did you read the example about Bastille Day in France? Was it Bastille Day? I mean, I read something about the French leader. The first lady? Yeah, the French first lady. Yeah, I remember Trump was like, you're in such good shape. Yes. And they translated it to, so where it could be taken as, you're in good health. You look to be in good health or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I would probably do the same thing in their position. Like, right. Because they said... Some journalists translated his compliment as Vous êtes en grande forme. Yeah, as you are in great health. But if it had been translated a different way, it would be like, yeah, like he was hitting on the First Lady of France. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So a lot of difficulty translating him. And part of the reason why translation is so powerful in world politics, because it changes the way that people or a country or leaders are perceived on the global stage. Yeah, it gives you an idea of how important translators really are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hats off to the translators and interpreters in the world today, especially. Yes. 
So, shall we move on to our main topic? Yes. Yeah, I thought we could warm up with some comma fails. <laughs> <laughs> Just like to show the importance of correct punctuation. Definitely. <laughs> There's some amazing ones. Yeah, I found this list on BuzzFeed. It's just, it's just so good. First one, Rachel Ray finds inspiration in cooking her family and a dog. <laughs> <laughs> so by leaving out the commas for the list, she yeah. finds inspiration in cooking her family and a dog. Yeah, two very different sentences there. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorites was this tweet. Yeah. Sh the hole in my yoga pants. In the butt. Oh, Are they yeah. still wearable? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> People are idiots. Okay, yeah. but anyway. Mm-hmm. So, without that comma or exclamation point or some form of function. <laughs> punctuation it sounds like she a hole in her yoga pants <laughs> in the butt specifically in the butt. yeah uh, gotta put that comma in there or exclamation point comma at the least <laughs> another one says man bacon makes everything taste good <laughs> Man bacon. Mm, yeah. I'm a fan of pig bacon, but that's just a personal preference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it pretty much changes the meaning a lot. Yeah. I like this one. Oh, exclamation point. Boy syrup. I think what they meant was, oh boy, syrup. I was cracking up when I read these. <laughs> They're so good. Yeah. Another one is a book actually by Bill Cosby, unfortunately. It's called Come On People. Definitely need to insert a comma there as well. Yeah, between the on and the people. Yeah, yeah. Come on, people. Yeah, again, two very different meetings. (laughs) (laughs) Another one, there's a sign that says Dead Slow Children Animals. (laughs) I think there might be more going on here than punctuation, but yeah, I don't even know. I'm not sure what the dead the dead slow. It sounds like somebody decided to make a sign in their own colloquial version of like go slow, right? Maybe it still sounds awful. Yeah, dead slow children animals. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure. No. <laughs> Not sure how to fix that one. No. <laughs> no. Another one is uh, an ad for a room. It says, uh, $900, pretty safe, furnished room. <laughs> it's pretty safe. Yeah. Safe enough for you. Yeah, exactly. So there's this um, <laughs> Facebook post. It has... Absolutely no commas or anything, so the sentence is, wake up, eat poop, school, eat poop, running, work, 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 eat poop, sleep. So, clearly, he likes to eat poop, apparently. Mm, Wake up, eat poop. He eats a lot of poop all day. This person. The next one we have is also toilet related. It is <laughs> toilet only for disabled elderly pregnant children. <laughs> <laughs> this one was my favorite, actually. I like the oxymoron. Yeah, yeah. Elderly yeah. children. <laughs> pregnant children, no less. Yeah, and they have to be disabled too. It's very specific. Oh, wow. All right. That one's a good one. So there's this one. We have two hours to kill someone. Come see us. (laughs) 
They needed a period. <laughs> yeah. Or at least a semicolon. <laughs> right, right. That's uh that's two different sentences right there. <laughs> It's so casual, too. We have two hours to kill someone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, here's another another good Facebook status. There's a picture of a big piece of meat, and it's kind of, like, not in any particular form. And it says, time to eat children. Uh, no thanks. Yeah, what pass. even is that in the picture? It looks yeah, disgusting. I don't know. It's big. It's big and not shaped like anything. It would make me very uncomfortable. Does it look that. like it has fur? I don't know. I uh, will post this article, obviously, as always, on our um, show notes, so you can go be the judge. Let us know what you think in the comments. Gross. And then there's the classic, Stop Clubbing. Baby seals. <laughs> Stop clubbing, comma, baby seals. Mm-hmm. The yeah. baby seals love to club, and we want them to stop. <laughs> and those baby seals dancing away in the club. <laughs> they're just, they're party animals. <laughs> <laughs> and normally this one I've seen, like, accompanied by another picture that's, like, someone with a club. And it's like, stop clubbing baby seals. Oh, is, is it actually like, stop clubbing baby seals? Yes. Like, uh, okay, okay. That's what I thought. <clears throat> yeah, because okay. apparently people do that. That's really, really upsetting. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Also, this is going to the Oxford comma debate. I don't know about you, Rachel, but I care a lot about this. Um, I do, I, yeah. Yeah, you do. Okay. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, Oxford comma, still important. The Oxford comma is when you are making a list and the debate is, do you really need a comma before the and at the end of the list? For example, uh, my room was blue, green, yellow, comma, and red, or my room was blue, green, yellow, and red with no comma in between yellow and red. I just made that sentence up. It wasn't that great, but you get the idea. Um, <laughs> so we have, and if anybody out there is on the fence uh, on the Oxford comma on this great linguistic debate, let me present to you the following argument. With an Oxford comma, we have the sentence, we invited the strippers, comma, JFK, comma, and Stalin. With no Oxford comma, we have the sentence, We invited the strippers, comma, JFK, and Stalin. And the accompanying picture is JFK and Stalin in underwear. As strippers, yeah. <laughs> yeah, as strippers. That's pretty convincing, in my opinion. I love that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody in my dorm in college had that like print it on their door i like that a lot <laughs> that's a pretty cool person <laughs> so that's just a few examples of why punctuation makes a really big difference right i found one more also um and this one wasn't comma i guess not all of these were commas but this one was love people period cook them period tasty food that's just like a place where periods were not... Somebody really didn't know what they were doing with periods, basically. Yeah. <sighs> it, that <sighs> took me a minute to understand. Love people, cook them tasty food. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just got a little punctuation happy there, I guess. Yeah, they got a little carried away. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Cooking people or cooking food for people, it's more or less the same, right? Yeah, right. There's actually, now I see we have, like, three references to cooking people in this episode so far. Let's... Oh, no, four. <laughs> I didn't even read this one. Let's eat grandma versus let's eat grandma. Like, yep. Very important. Yeah. All right, four. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. So, let's move on to a few underused punctuation marks. 
Yeah. Have you seen these before? Some of them, but not all, for sure. This actually might go kind of well. In episode 16, I believe it was, yes, in episode 16, we worked on the evolution of the English language. The first one on the list of underused punctuation marks uh, was an obelisk. It looks like a cross or two crosses stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. It used to be used as a reference mark in printed matter or to indicate that somebody's died. It's also called a dagger. Mm -hmm. I thought this was really interesting. It was used in ancient texts to mark a word or passage as corrupt or doubtful. That was interesting. Yeah. It's like a an old school thinking emoji, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, like the therefore sign? Uh-huh. That's like a little triangle of dots. It's like three dots, one at the top and then two at the bottom. Okay. So that's the therefore sign. But the because sign is that, but upside down. So you've got two dots at the top and one in the center at the bottom. Oh, that would actually be really useful for note taking, I would imagine. Yeah, because, so I had never used that, but that's really cool. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. Another one that we have is the section sign. You've probably seen this one before. It kind of looks like two S's on top of one another. And it's usually used in legal code to refer to a particular section of a document. Mm -hmm. The one that I really liked from the BuzzFeed article was the exclamation comma. Oh. So it's basically a line over a comma. And it's like a comma, but you're excited about the thing that you just said. I feel like that would be really useful. Yeah. Do you have like an example sentence that you could use that in? Um... Oof, let me think. Yesterday I won the lottery, and today I had lunch with Margaret. <laughs> I like that. So only the first half of the sentence is ex- ex- exclamation point worthy. Yeah, definitely. I like. Good job. <laughs> Yesterday I won the lottery, and today I I had lunch with Margaret. (laughs) Sorry, Margaret. (laughs) Do you really have a friend named Margaret? No. Oh, okay. It'd be really funny if you did. (laughs) I don't think I do either. Hmm. No. Another one we have is the Hedera. I've never seen this before, but it's really beautiful. It's also known as the floral heart, so it's like a pretty black heart with a little squiggly line on top, Mm -hmm. and it used to be used in Latin texts as a punctuation mark between paragraphs in long documents, especially when line breaks weren't as common. And hedera is the Latin word for ivy, so it looks a little bit like ivy, I guess, like an ivy leaf, maybe? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, for sure. I've seen it before, but like on like very old texts, like maybe in museums or something like that. Ah, yeah. Well, now we know why it's there. Yeah, I didn't know. Another one similar to the exclamation comma is the question comma. So it's a question mark over a comma instead of a dot. Oh. So you ask a question, but continue the sentence. I feel like you can, I mean, we'll get there, but I feel like you can kind of do that in Spanish, too. Like, Mm -hmm. like the question mark doesn't necessarily indicate the end of a sentence, whereas in English it does. That's why you're... Right. Yeah, that's true. Autocorrect always capitalizes the next letter. Mm Mm-hmm. Another one, which was, uh, you've probably seen it before, it's called the pill crow, though. Um, It looks like a backwards P. And then the gap in the P is colored in, and it's just used to denote individual paragraphs. Yeah. So I guess that one's not quite as exciting as the question comma. What did you call it? Yeah, the question comma. Question comma. Okay, nice. (laughs) And my favorite one was snark. So it's it looks kind of like a backwards question mark. Mm. And it's also called the irony mark. And it's used to indicate that there's another layer of meaning in a sentence. Huh. So usually, like, if you're using sarcasm or irony. Ah, that is really interesting. It's essentially a tool for smart people 
to use to make stupid people feel even stupider. Cool, I've never <laughs> heard of that. Snark. Yeah, me neither. I like that. Very cool. Another one in this article is called the Interrobang. Yeah. Um, Interrobang? Yeah, so... Yeah, the interrobang is a question mark and an exclamation point together in one, Mm -hmm. which we always, I do that all the time, like question mark and exclamation point. Right. But it's really useful when they're combined together and it looks cool too. Yeah, it does look cool. Although with this font, it kind of looks just like a dark question mark. Oh, okay. Yeah. So those are some of the less common punctuation marks that we have. Mm Mm-hmm. And so maybe we can start incorporating them into our everyday use of punctuation. Yeah, and if you want to check out some more, you can go to the post on our website for this episode and check out the BuzzFeed article that we'll list there. Cool. So I found this article about like the evolution of punctuation. Uh-huh. And it's actually fascinating. Yeah, I haven't seen this. So So Basically, in a nutshell, there was no punctuation until around the 3rd century BCE. Mm -hmm. And before that, yeah, all the words were together. There were no spaces. You couldn't tell, like, where one sentence ended or the next began. So it was impossible to just read a document through. You had to study it and really work to figure out what were the individual words and what were the individual sentences and how was it meant to be expressed. Wow. Is it a question or is it not a question? And so in the 3rd century BCE in Alexandria, Aristophanes came up with this system for saying like how long of a pause you should have. So a point, a dot at the bottom yeah. was like a short pause in the middle was like a medium pause and at the top was the longest pause. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, so huh. pretty much he came up with that, but then the Romans kind of like threw it out. They were like, that's not useful. Ah. We're just going to go back to writing letters all scrunched together and not <laughs> being able to read it like on a first read. Oh, that's funny. And actually, it's funny. It said, when asked to read aloud from an unfamiliar document, the second century writer, Aulus Gallius, said that he would mangle its meaning and emphasize its words incorrectly Mm. because it's impossible. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you don't realize how much you need punctuation until it's gone. (laughs) And even if you think about, like, on social media, like usernames or handles or Mm -hmm. whatever sometimes you don't read it correctly because you don't know what are different words yeah it's really hard especially in a different language trying to read a handle in a different language oh yeah i even fail it in english so i mean (laughs) yeah right exactly so The reason that they weren't too concerned with being able to read really quickly was the tradition was oral, so public speaking, and that was the way that most communication happened. However, around the 4th and 5th centuries, Christianity was starting to get a lot more powerful, so pagans before that had always passed their traditions and culture by word of mouth but christian in the christian tradition it was a lot more written so they started using dots paragraph marks um like the p one that we talked about the backwards p yeah the, the, the pil- pilcro yeah pilcro <laughs> it, something that looks like a seven a, like what we use for cents and something that looks like gamma. Huh. So as they spread throughout Europe, Aristophanes' system with the three dots started being used again. Readopted. Readopted, yeah. yeah. But with some modifications. So they started using spaces between words because the Scottish and Irish monks were tired of trying to figure out like these unfamiliar Latin words, like where they were differentiated. Uh And in Germany, King Charlemagne ordered this monk to devise a unified alphabet. So that's what we use as lowercase 
letters. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. I feel like we need to bring that up again in our evolution of English part two when that happens. Yeah, definitely. Maybe we can dive a little deeper into that. Cool. Cool, yeah. How we came up with capital and lowercase letters. I yeah. That's... Really interesting. And yeah, totally. even so around like the 8th century or so, I think, they were borrowing things from musical notation, like Gregorian chants mm-hmm. and things like that. Yeah. So there was like an upside down semicolon that evolved into the modern colon yeah and they actually began to have like a grammatical meaning instead of just indicating pauses Ah. so before that they didn't have like a grammatical meaning so around the time of the printing press in the 1450s or so that's when it was really really solidified and it like froze in place and didn't change for like hundreds of years pretty much wow until now and apparently now with emojis we are starting to evolve some of the grammatical uses of punctuation marks oh really Mm -hmm. does it say how so well it says punctuation it turns out is not dead it was just waiting for the next technological bandwagon on which to leap Now we've found it, it's up to us readers and writers once more to decide how we're going to punctuate our words for the next 2,000 years. Uh, At first I was kind of resistant to the emoji wave. Mm -hmm. I was like, I can convey what I want with words, but (laughs) I'm totally into it now. Rachel and I use a Chinese app to communicate because that way if I ever have trouble communicating with her I can definitely find her over WeChat. You've probably seen a few of the special Chinese emojis on WeChat. I don't know that I've looked around that much. Yeah there's one that's like a smirk that's what it's translated into. It's like a smiley face but looking to the side. Mm Or um, there's another one that's like uh, laughing it's laughing but it's like covering its mouth like <laughs> oh, okay or there's one more that stands out to me it's like laughing and then covering one side of its face like oh man you know oh, okay but yeah actually that's a good idea for an episode is just emojis yeah for different parts of the world cool but yeah they're so useful yeah they are you don't have to say any words you just send one smiley face that represents what you mean. Yeah, or a thumbs up even, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, that actually is a good segue into the final section of this show today, which is punctuation in different languages. Mm-hmm. We can't forget different languages. So I found a list of ways different languages use punctuation marks. And actually, I knew some of these things already, but I never really thought thought about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, The first one I didn't know, it's the Greek language uses the semicolon as a question mark, and the colon and semicolon are formed by a raised period in the middle of the line. So, like at the top of a lowercase o, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And I guess they're just kind of classified into one. Yeah, which is really interesting, actually, because from the Aristophanes system, Mm -hmm. the middle dot, exactly that, was the medium pause. Mm. So a semicolon and a colon are a medium length pause. (gasps) Was Aristophanes Greek? Mm Mm-hmm. What? That's so crazy. Super interesting. (laughs) Tied in. (laughs) Cool. Similarly, so some languages like Spanish, Catalan... Older languages, I guess. Yeah, older languages use an upside down interrogation or exclamation point at the beginning of the segment of the sentence that is a question or is an exclamation. Right, right. For example, when you have a question in Spanish, the whole sentence isn't necessarily a question. Yeah. So for example, I if I go to the park later today, that's not a question. Mm-hmm. Do you want to come with me? That part is a question. So you would mark the beginning of the question at quieres ir conmigo so right before the do you want to come with me Mm -hmm. exactly is it like that in um french i don't know actually i don't think so i don't think french has upside down question marks uh french speakers please correct us if we're wrong on this Mm -hmm. but no i don't think so German and French also spanish europe in general the comma is a decimal when you're writing numbers 
So instead of 1.39 for that much money, like 1 euro and 39 euro cents, it would be 1 comma 39. Mm -hmm. And then the euro symbol is at the end of the price tag as well. So you might have like a million, 300,000, 500, and it would be 1.300.500 instead of commas. Right. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, for separating like large numbers, they use Mm -hmm. points as well. Yeah. And in German and sometimes in Spanish as well, there are different quotation marks. Mm -hmm. So in German, it's like two little lines at the bottom at the beginning, right? It's... Yeah, it's like two little commas together. Right. And then the sentence and then the same ending quotation marks that we use. Except they're in the opposite direction. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so two little commas at the beginning of a quote, and at the end of the quote, it's what we would use at the beginning of a quotation in English. Mm, okay. Wait, it looks like it's the same ending ones that we use. Hmm. I know that that's not what i've seen in german and i couldn't like my german keyboard wouldn't let me do it hold on let me just google it oh yeah you're right but in the article it says it the other way (laughs) yep they're wrong but yeah sometimes (laughs) i think in several languages for quotes instead of using things that look like apostrophes or commas or something Mm -hmm. it's like two little almost arrows Mm -hmm. on either side facing in right uh, I've seen them facing the opposite direction as well, I think. Okay. Have you? Maybe. Uh, I don't know. I cannot confirm. I just... <laughs> yeah. Cannot confirm or deny. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It says... You know what? It's German. I just binged it because Google doesn't work in China. Mm-hmm. But it says... Alternatively, um, you can do the double, like a double arrow, like mm-hmm. like what you're describing in Spanish, but they're going in the opposite direction. It's kind of funny okay. that both of them are the opposite direction. Yeah. <laughs> like the arrows and the apostrophe. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I didn't know this about French. Uh, there's a space before all punctuation marks and symbols. That was really interesting. So I wasn't sure exactly what that was talking about. Like, um... Oh, for commas and stuff. Yeah, or periods. Like, instead of putting the period Mm -hmm. right next to the last letter of a sentence, it would be, like, space, period, space, comma. Oh, my God. Sometimes I see that. Oh, yeah? But I think it's usually a mistake when I see it from, like, English speakers. Ah! Just who are bad at typing or something. And I always think it looks horrible. (laughs) Well, you know, the double space isn't a thing anymore. I do know that, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people still think that you need two spaces after a period, but no. Yeah. You do not. Single space now. Mm -hmm. FYI, everybody, don't put two spaces after a period. (laughs) (laughs) Just makes you look old. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) So, Arabic, Persian, and Urdu languages, which are written from right to left, use... A backwards question mark Mm -hmm. and a backwards comma. Mm -hmm. But this is like a modern thing because Arabic before didn't use any punctuation. Ah. However, Hebrew, which is also written right to left, uses the same punctuation marks as English. Yeah, so they don't reverse their symbols. Right. That's really cool. Yeah, I have seen that in Arabic script, like a backwards question mark. Mm. It's hard to get used to. It's interesting. But it makes sense that you would turn it around. I mean, you turn around the direction you're going. So Mm -hmm. Uh, Chinese uses a circle that's not filled in as a period. Yeah. I remember when I first started seeing this, I was like, what is wrong with that period? It must be the script. <laughs> <laughs> but it's everywhere. Yeah, that's how they write. That's so funny. Yeah. I had never seen that. Yeah, it's like slightly bigger. I wonder how many other languages used to not use punctuation besides Arabic and English. Like, I wonder how modern punctuation is now Uh uh-huh old turkish used to use a colon instead of a space yeah in between all the words that's interesting sounds like a lot of work (laughs) so in danish they use a division sign 
instead of using like an X for negation. Yeah, that's funny. I would not get that if not no. if I hadn't been informed. <laughs> no, it'd be like dividing what? <laughs> right, right, exactly. And the division sign is in like a dot and then a line and then a dot under that too. Right. Yeah, that's really funny. Well, cool. I think that pretty much wraps up our punctuation episode. We would love to hear from you if you have any other interesting punctuation experiences. Mm-hmm. Thanks to my brother's girlfriend, Emily, for giving us the idea for this episode. And yeah. So now it's time for our Lost in Translation. We we Lost in Translation. <laughs> This week, our lesson translation moment comes from Jenny. And Jenny is a Brit whose family lived in France for a while. And she's going to tell us a story of when she was living in France. So basically, when um, I was helping my dad doing gardening for our neighbor, in French, the words for a wheelbarrow and a titwank sound very similar. Oh, my God. So my dad tried to ask my 80-year-old neighbour to borrow her wheelbarrow, which is a brouette. Instead, he asked her for a brolette. My dad asked my 80-year-old neighbour for a titwank. (laughs) Oh, my God. That's awesome. Oh, my God. That's so inappropriate. (laughs) That's so uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. yeah, your poor dad. And the poor lady. <laughs> right, right. Just like all around lack of comfort for everybody. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you so much, Jenny, for submitting that yes, story to us. I think that might be the most uncomfortable Lost in Translation moment we've got. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oof. Mm. Oh, wow. Uh, I need to go take a shower. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Well, please send us your Lost in Translation moments. We would love to hear from you. Yes, please. So what do you think? We'd love to hear what you think about punctuation. What do you think about the Oxford comma, too? Yeah. Does anybody have a really convincing argument that's going to sway us? Mm-hmm. We want to know. Yeah. And subscribe to our podcast. Mm-hmm. So that way you'll get the latest episodes as soon as they come out. Yep. Once a week. Uh, you can follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest. And we also now have a YouTube channel. So if you want to go listen to our episodes from there you're welcome to maybe we'll start doing some live videos eventually Mm -hmm. that would be really cool yeah that'd be fun and please leave us a review on itunes like carrie boss 32 did (laughs) that is so cool yeah more people review us the more people see us yeah and please tell your friends about it if you liked it and just spread the word and Let us feel the love. Yeah, give us love and help your friends because a lot of people don't know how to podcast. Yeah. So if they don't know how, especially if you really enjoy it, you can help them download a podcast app and help them set it up so that they're subscribed and they get notifications when we release a new episode. Yeah. We also like to write about our experiences living and traveling abroad. So you can also subscribe to our blog from our website. Yes. Yes, please do. And our next episode is going to be about Gat Hofstede's cultural dimensions. We've talked a lot about this kind of in passing on the podcast, like low information and high information cultures. So uh, Mm -hmm. we'll kind of dive into that. It is super interesting stuff. I'm really stoked to record that later. Uh, So that'll give you some good background into understanding how different cultures relate to one another. So yeah or how they don't yeah all right well thanks for listening yeah thanks everybody see you next week hope you have a great week bye bye